first speaker is Professor Tony Dunhill from the UK. He's president of the British Institute of NDT, and he works for Rolls-Royce. Many of you probably flew in aeroplanes that had Rolls-Royce engines coming here, so you'd be quite keen to know that they do NDT quite well in Rolls-Royce. Tony Dunhill. I've had the, the dubious honour of chairing a working group that's produced a report for the UK government. In fact, it was commissioned by the UK government, and the title of the report is the title of this paper, well, for this, The Landscape for the Future of NDT in the UK Economy. And the, I want to explain why we produced this report and some of the impacts that it's had, and uh, where we've demonstrated that NDT has been a real benefit, and how we should always make sure that we are on the list of things that has to be done in any engineering programme. So uh, we just going the, the this is the report, and there are, were a whole load at the BINDT stand, but they've all seemed to have disappeared. So I'm glad some have been distributed, and this uh, this is mine, so we're not having that. <laughs> but the the report contents uh, is, is listed here. So we talk about the scope of NDT, the importance of NDT, uh, what sort of market overview have we got, where we see the future of it going, and how do you actually establish a roadmap for that future. And we go through the actions that are needed that are going to enable NDT to become engaged fully with engineering. In the UK, the, the government has identified eight great technologies they're described as. And so we reviewed those eight, and lo and behold, NDT impacts five of them. One of the eight great technologies is high-value manufacturing, and Rolls-Royce is obviously deeply involved in that. Uh, and the government have also um, produced a list of 22 competencies that are needed for high-value manufacturing, and lo and behold, NDT impacts every 22 of them. Uh, we'd recently had in our UK research centre, we had a presentation from our um, sort of mid-TRL funding agency, uh, Innovate UK it's called, and uh, she was going on about uh, these 22 competencies and how it's important that we match some of them and you know, what, where did we fit in them. So I was able to give her this report and say that we impacted every 22 of them and her reaction was, oh, well, you better come and see us then. So in, even in the funding agency, the appreciation of, of what NDT can do to, the, to, to these technologies isn't, isn't high. So we need some sort of means of impacting and telling the, the, the governance organisations of our existence. And although there aren't any of these copies left, there is a link on the BIT website where you can download a PDF version. So going back in history a little bit, we, we published this thing in April, um, but it started its existence in 2010-2011. The, the then president of the institute, Steve Lavender, had lunch with a local MP and she happened to be on a technology um, panel and uh, they, they started talking NDT and she hadn't heard of it so she said well why don't you come down to Fort Cully's house near Westminster and describe what we're doing to my fellow MPs so they had a little meeting down there and the question back from the MPs was so how big is NDT so we sort of said well there's 2,000 obviously in the Institute uh, we didn't know much more than that really and do we matter? And then we started talking about various disasters that had occurred and that NDT hadn't been used properly. And, and, and they said, well, yeah, that's, those are disasters that happened. What's, what's not happening? Well, you know, why, how much are you stopping? Well, we didn't really know that either. And then they said, uh, so if, if we were important and you did matter, what are, the, what are the problems you got? And we didn't know that either. So all in all, we didn't know very much. So. We started to think about it and we had consulted our centaur who has great advice and we looked at what other sectors did and lo and behold they produced government reports. So we needed to know more about ourselves. And there's, uh, th this was produced by a group called the Knowledge Transfer Network, which I have to be honest and I had no understanding of what they did uh, until I engaged with them and then I found out that their job was to connect bits of engineering together to make it so that you were fully connected and you could transfer your knowledge, um, which in this case we've, we've managed to do. So the timeline of the report was that uh, BINDT set up a working group. I was uh, unhappily volunteered to chair that working group. Um, we decided the first thing to do would be to survey the various industry sectors because the, the, the regulations are different, the requirements are different. 
So we, we've pinpointed some people, arm, twisted their arms to make sure that they filled out these surveys. We looked at 13 sectors, and then we held a couple of workshops, which was funded by this, this agency, um, to look at the value of NDT, and could we come up with stories about where we'd actually save value. Then, it's the wrong sort of right, isn't it? <laughs> or was it the right sort of right? Um, we then looked at different types of reports that had been issued, and we liked the format of the one we'd chosen, so we started to script the, uh, and work out how it was going to be. Last September, not September, just gone, the year last September, we issued 200 copies to our um, annual conference in, in, uh, in the UK, and we had 81 comments back, most of them were polite, and that meant that we could revise the, 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 the document, and we pu published the version, this version in, in April. Those were the sectors we, we looked at, and in, in near the middle of the report, there's a, a ghastly table which does actually describe the uh, impact and importance of NDT in each of the sectors. And so there's a little description, and then we, we say that you can refer to deeper knowledge if you so wish. We came up with some facts, and I've got them in, in two different colours here. Um, the, the ones in dark are ones that we're pretty confident about, and the ones in pale are about as vague as they look on the screen. Um, because, to be honest, we don't really know a lot about what we do. Mainly because it's in the title, because we know about not what we don't do, because we have none in the title. The, we, we know we have an aging demographic, and there was a snapshot of the population done in 2007 across a number of institutes, looking at membership and uh, qualified practitioners, and we reckon that there's about a 35,000 population of NDT practitioners in the UK. So that's taking the PCN certificate holders and the CSU and various other company schemes and rolling, wrapping them all up. And although everyone has to be certified and all got to be recorded, actually unwrapping those numbers is really quite hard. And I think it's a role that perhaps the national institutes could do is to start understanding their own national statistics and so that we get a much better grasp of, of the scope of our, our population. So even if just sticking with that demographic and assuming we all have to work till we're 103, then by 2017, then we're going to be about 9% underpopulated if we just carry on as we are. And then if you take another 10 years onto that, we're going to be about 15% underpopulated. So to correct for that, we need to be taking in something like 500 to 870, 850 people a year. Into, it's just UK-based to stabilize the business. <coughs> then we wanted to know how many inspections were done every day. Well, you think that'd be quite easy to find out, but it's not. And so I made a stab in the dark and I said, well, it's probably 20,000. And I know a guy who's just up by Glasgow Airport and he does 8,000 blades a day. So I was fairly safe on my 20,000. And then the people said, no, 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 it's gotta be more than that. And I got a bit scared. So I wrote down 25,000. I get now people coming back to me and say, do you know there are 25,000 inspections done a day in the UK? Oh, really? <laughs> so <laughs> these things become facts very quickly. But it would be useful to know a, a, a much more accurate, much more confident figure than that. But one thing we do know is that rail NDT has, has reduced the rail breaks a year because of the improved inspection and management system that they put in place. And there was a beautiful paper uh, this, I'll just look forward to this diagram. There was a beautiful p paper presented in 2012 at our UK conference, and this showed back in 1999, when we had the Hatfield rail crash, the, the, the network system was getting about 900 rail breaks a year, on, and, and they were living with that, and that was sort of considered okay. And, and then the Hatfield rail crash happened, they realized these rail breaks were actually quite dangerous, so they instigated ultrasonic inspection again. They had been doing it years ago, and then it got dropped because of ownership and outsourcing and stuff. And they started to cleanse the network uh, over about a four or five year period. So that's the first initial drop. And then they started to improve the technique, and then you get another, a second drop. And so we're now down, in 2012, it was about 125 rail breaks a year, and they're now down to something like 80. And it's, it's so rare in NDT that you find out the things you've missed or haven't found. And in, this is the case where actually those rail breaks were not detected, and so we, we, but, but they were detected eventually because the rail broke. So having a, 
a story where you can actually say what you've not found is, is a really powerful thing. So we, we must try and, and develop those stories and, and let people know about them. So then, I'm sort of moving on to the, the, the uh, purpose of the talk, or the session, and the importance of NDT. Now, we, we must always remember that we're a service, and to be important in engineering, you've got to give something to the people who are receiving your information. And I've, what I've tried to do here is just put an attribute and, a, and, and whether NDT actually contributes to that and, and how we do that. So if you think of contributing the whole of engineering, then you can definitely say we do, because we, we, we are one of the tools that are used to monitor the quality of the part and to make sure it can be used through its service life. So we can, we, we, we can definitely say that we contribute to that. And we are practical to implement. NDT is nothing if not practical, because you've got to be able to do it. And uh, you talk to any practitioner, and they have immense skills in, in applying the various techniques. However, I don't think we're particularly understandable to our users. And I've given reports where I've dimensioned a defect as minus 8 dB of a 50 thou diameter flat bottom hole. Well, to be honest, there's not a lot you can do with that. There's, there's no, I mean, they want something that says it's a millimeter or 1.3 millimeters, and they want to know if it's a rough crack, they want to know the angle of the crack. Now, all of those things, you, we're getting to the point where we can start to talk about that. But as a general rule, we don't give information that is actually of any use. Um, we've also got to be valid. Now, to validate an inspection is a really hard thing to do, and it's usually a very expensive thing to do. So for the very well-regulated industries, then those uh, validation processes are carried out, and people spend millions upon millions of pounds to do it. However, at the end of it, you've got an inspection that you can use. So really, we want to try and make that process much more affordable, and um, having better models to do the validation with, and having national or international facilities where we can go and hire machinery to do that validation for us, growing real defects, maybe using uh, uh, powder addition, you know, um, uh, additive manufacturing processes to, to make the types of shapes of defects they're interested in, uh, are, are ways of doing it. But there ought to be a pathway that that's goes for low cost validation. And understanding, and, and with that, then becomes the limitations of the processes that you're using. So you're, you can operate within the understanding of your limitations. And that's, that's a key thing, because if you, very often, if you, if you push back to a, uh, a requirement and say, well, I can't do that, but I can, inspect, I can do this size, and I can't go that close to the edge, but I can go within two millimeters or something, then people can adjust their life in calculations or their risk levels, and then they know what they're talking about, they know the world they're in. And then the other thing we have to be, to be important, is to be recognized as important. And really, we don't do that. We don't give out information that says what wonderful things we've done, how many lives we've saved, because it's so hard to know what disaster you've avoided. But where we have got the information, we should be prepared to put that in the public domain, domain and really be very proud of it. So uh, these were two examples. I've talked about the British Rail one. This is a Rolls-Royce one, and here we were asked to uh, design to a, a design philosophy called damage tolerant <coughs> design. And the idea there is that you match the duty cycle of the part with the material properties and the inspection capability, and you have a full agreement with the number of cycles at what stress level that that material can sustain and the ma maximum initial defect size that's going to be there. So that contour map is, is actual crack sizes. Uh, the red is something in the order of half a millimeter, and the blue is something in the order of two millimeters. So in some parts of that aerofoil, it really doesn't, you know, you can, you can cope with a very big defect. In other parts, you've got to find a really small one. And some of those are quite, quite difficult places. So we've ended up on this particular part doing a, a robotized eddy current test. It's gone through a POD process, which gives us the, the uh, reliability we're interested in. And there's a factory north of Nottingham churning these out. I, sh I should say they take about 29 hours to do a part, so it's quite, quite, a, quite a slow process. But nonetheless, you end up with a part that is fit for purpose, and it will last a, a, a determined length of life. 
Also, the other great thing is that when it comes to the end of that life, we've got an inspection process that we might be able to then redo, and you might be able to give it another lease of life or portion of. Out of the report, which I recommend to anyone to read, and if you're a very busy person, there's a section called the five-minute read. It actually takes about six and a half minutes, but <laughs> <laughs> once you're in, you can't get out. You know? It's a bit like NDT. Um, we, I, I've picked out the... Uh, the, the, on the section on importance, I've picked out the, 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 the various headings that we had. So, the importance of new manufacture, then obviously the critical structures use um, uh, in virtually every stage of manufacture. I know um, someone's done an analysis on some of the Rolls-Royce parts, and they get inspected about 12 or 14 times throughout their course of manufacture. And they think, oh, that's ridiculous, but it's, it's actually a very low-cost process to do, say, a penetrant test, and you might as well because you're just checking the processes right. And then, of course, I talked about the, the damage tolerance NDT processes. And we, we then become a vital enabler to that design. And in fact, there's, there's lots of processes that wouldn't be allowed to be used unless you had a reliable NDT process attached to it. And then through life, well, we know all plant degrades and we're surrounded by aging infrastructure, which, which is going to be an enormous problem if we don't allow it to continue its life. And NDT and condition monitoring are the tools that engineers are going to be using. And just imagine if there wasn't NDT, then the, the cost of replacing all this stuff would be just absolutely astronomical. And in fact, we'd have got to the point where we would be over-designing even more than the Victorians did, so that the, the amount of resource it would need to make a plant would be just even higher. Um, and a, a great thing I learned from the early days of the UK Research Centre, RCNDE, was that the power station boys were saying, well, do you realize that the, the outage dates are actually dictated by the crack growth? And that if we can reliably find a smaller defect, we can extend the time between outages. And so it was directly related to how well the NDT was done. Because if you could, if you could reliably find a smaller crack, then you, you could let it grow for longer before you had to reinspect for it. And new processes. Now, I've been, within roles, I've been involved a lot in the new materials, new designs, new processes, the manufacturing processes. And we always apply as intensive NDT as possible to the to, to, at that stage, so that you know what's inside it. And you can give information to the metallurgist to say that that's where you ought to cut it up and have a look, or that's how you ought, that's where you ought to do the mechanical test, because if you can find things and then find out that they don't matter, well then you've learned something and you can live with that as a type of defect. But if you do, you do find things that they do matter, then you can start to improve the material. So it's important to get the NDT happening at that development stage. Looking at some enabling actions, well, publicizing our case study, the case studies is a really important thing. And, and within, the, within the British Institute, uh, we've now set up a marketing uh, group and part of that is to generate stories that we can publicize outside of our normal publications. So that's, that's what I've described as a sustained PR assault on engineering who aren't engaging with NDT. And if we can get lower cost validation processes that include the business case, we are very, very bad, I think, at, at attaching ourselves to the business case of the plant or the uh, structure that we're inspecting. We ought to be understanding where the business advantages are and putting that, you know, putting us right in their <coughs> forefront because then we're saving the money. We need to grow the links with the structural integrity community, so I've, I've given up describing defects as minus 8 dB, regardless of the size they actually are, minus 8 dB of a hole. I, I now try and say, well, I think there is a 60% chance of it being 1.2 millimeters and there's an 80% chance it's going to be smaller than some other size. And for areas that are, aren't regulated, then it's my view that the insurance companies are the regulators. And so we ought to be engaging with insurance financiers more to uh, grow their perception of the benefits of NDT. Um, and then two more on just the people. So raising the profile of NDT as a profession, and, and I've been talking to some of the service NDT companies, and you can get a really good salary being, being an inspector. So it's actually quite a good living. Uh, and, but uh, everyone you may have to meet falls into it by accident, so we've got to change that. And as regards to the technology, and what we've done in the UK Research Centre is we've got each sector to adopt 
the best approach, which is the Rolls-Royce approach, amazingly enough, um, where we've, we've got a clear view of what inspection capability we want in five years' time. So actually it's, now, it's next year. And then in 10 years' time, so we've got it listed for 2020, and then in uh, 20 years' time, so I've got it listed for 2030. And we've done that across the sectors that are members of the RCNDE, and that's become uh, an internal combined document. With that, we engage with government, and we have a strategic partnership with them to deliver that sort of technology. And it also focuses the minds of the academics who realize that actually the business, or, or a lot of engineering companies, have as long a term vision as they have. So we're, we, we know the products that we're going to have in 2030. They're, gonna, they're, they're the ones we're making now. They'll still be flying around. And we have to grow the understanding that NTT is this great enabler for all the sectors. And without us, a lot of things won't work. One minute. Let's hope I'm near the end. It's so difficult to tell. Um, the, my experience is that you can grow technology up through the, the very early levels relatively <coughs> easily and at fairly low cost. But it's getting them translated into the TRL-7s, where you're actually used in a factory or on a, on a plant, is the difficult bit. And, we, uh, and there are funding agencies across all national and international uh, institutions that have money that can do that. And we just have to engage with it and make sure they understand what, what we need. And so securing that mid-TRL level funding is important. And we need to appoint custodian organizations, I think, as librarians for the various test pieces that we, that we have amongst us. Because the, the, there's an awful lot of value in those test pieces, and most of them aren't known to the community. And I think that's the end, so that's probably the minute is up. <laughs>